Good morning, everyone, and welcome to St. Andrews. This morning's scripture is from two places, Psalm 85 and Luke 10. Psalm 85. You showed favor to your land, O Lord. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people and covered all their sins. You set aside all your wrath and turned from your fierce anger. Restore us again, O God, our Savior, and put away your displeasure toward us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger through all generations? Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your unfailing love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. I will listen to what God the Lord will say. He promises peace to his people, his saints, but let them not return to folly. Surely his salvation is near those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Love and faithfulness meet together. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Faithfulness springs forth from the earth, and righteousness looks down from heaven. The Lord will indeed give what is good, and our land will yield its harvest. Righteousness goes before him and prepares the way for his steps. And Luke, we are in chapter 10, 38 to 42. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he had to say. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. May God bless the reading of his word. Amen. Indeed. Thank you, Megan. Thank you for reading for us today. Uh, before we get to the message today, I'd like to uh, explain a little bit about where we are and where we're going, and uh, that may be helpful for you in understanding this message and messages throughout Lent. Uh, we're looking at this issue of discipleship, and a couple of weeks ago on February the 14th, we looked at how do I become a Christian, it kind of lays the foundation and then the next week on February the 21st, we talked about our identity in Christ and how our primary identity changes as we become a follower of Jesus as an adopted child of God. And now we're going, in the next four weeks, we're going to be looking at um, uh, different aspects of discipleship. And I look at it in terms of these four quadrants Today, we're going to be looking at our heart relationship with the living God. And next week, we're going to look at our head relationship with the living God. How, uh, you know, doctrines and theology impact us as the Holy Spirit grants us understanding to the faith that we have. So that's the, the vertical dimension, if you will. And then we move to the horizontal dimension, uh, which we'll be looking at the hands in terms of Christian service as part of discipleship and also on the horizontal, the other side of horizontal, I'm calling it humanity, if you will. And, uh, and that's how we relate to other people, both within the body of Christ and outside of the body of Christ as well. And all four of these uh, are different aspects or quadrants of discipleship, and we're going to look at each one in turn. So let's join our hearts together in a word of prayer as we prepare ourselves for what he has to say to us. Lord, we do give you thanksgiving that you love us so much that uh, you uh, continue to uh, draw us unto yourself, and uh, we pray that You'd help us, Lord, in our weakness to draw near to you as well. Lord, we recognize that so often the things around us in our homes, if we're joining us online or even here in the sanctuary today, uh, distract us. Uh, things on our phones, perhaps, uh, things that are around us, people that are around us, uh, things that are on our mind, 
So many things distract us from what you would say. So we pray that you'd cleanse our thoughts today so that we might encounter you, the living God, and that we'd be given uh, ear to hear that still small voice of yours. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. When I became a Christian, it happened through a dramatic conversion experience. That's not everybody's experience, and that's fine. We have different experiences, and the Holy Spirit works in different ways with different people. Uh, But mine was a dramatic conversion experience on the beaches of Florida. And at the time, I had no idea about how to grow as a Christian. I didn't grow up in a Christian household and wasn't in a Christian environment, but intuitively, I knew that Christians read their Bibles. And so I figured, well, if I'm going to grow as a Christian, I'd better get a Bible. And so I uh, figured, well, churches have Bibles. So I went and found a church in a marathon in the Florida Keys, and I found it locked tight. And I went to another church, and it was locked up tight, and another church was locked up tight as well. So it frustrated my initial attempts to grow as a Christian, even upon immediate conversion, immediate dramatic conversion experience. And many Christians, frankly, are in the same state for a prolonged period of time. They just do not know how to grow as followers of the way, followers of Jesus. And like me in those early days, they get frustrated in their attempts to grow because they don't have any guidance. They don't have anybody to come alongside them and and point uh, the way for them. Now, recently, we looked at, as I mentioned, how how do I become a Christian? And secondly, we looked at our identity in Christ, both of which point to the no part of our mission, you know, no, grow, show Christ. And, um, uh, you know, knowing Jesus, knowing yourself as a child of God by his amazing grace that he lavishes upon us. And in the next several weeks, we're going to be looking at uh, the different ways we grow as followers of the way. And today, we're going to look at some of the essential aspects of how we grow as Christians pointing to that vertical relationship with the living God. Consider marriage relationships, for example, by some miracle of grace, truly and frankly, by some miracle of grace, Eleanor and I will be married for 40 years this year. I thought I might hear an amen, but anyway... Some in this congregation have uh, been married much longer than that, and we, we celebrate those relationships as the very closest thing on earth that resembles a relationship between Christ and his church. That's what the scriptures say. Marriage is the closest thing that we have. A healthy marriage requires time. Time spent together as you commit to do life together through the valleys and the shadows and also through the peaks and the mountaintop experiences of life. There'll be times of grief and desperation perhaps as well as times of laughter and triumph and celebration and joy. And healthy marriages require effective communication which takes quality time spent together as you experience life together. And the same is true in our relationship with God. And today we're going to be exploring some very typical practices of Christians that have enabled followers of the way to live a life of continual growth and maturation. We're going to look at three things specifically that have helped followers of Jesus uh, to nourish their spiritual lives. And that is listening prayer, first of all, listening listening in the word, and thirdly, spiritual exercises. But before we get there, let's consider our passage that's before us today, because it's a really interesting passage. And uh, that brings us to our context. In our passage, we find a barrier-breaking story as we find Mary at the feet of Jesus, while Martha, you know, is off busy in the kitchen making preparations for a meal. 
on the surface, it's no big deal. I mean, Martha presents as if she needs help and she asks for it, but as so often happens when reading the scriptures, there's more going on than meets the eye, more going on than what's at the surface. And in that cultural context, there were clear divisions between men and women. In the main room of the house, that's where men would meet. The kitchen and other rooms that outsiders normally wouldn't see, that's where the women hang on, hung out. Mary, sitting at the feet of Jesus while he was teaching, was taking upon herself the posture of a man. And she crossed an invisible boundary in their social world. Women were to be uneducated. They were not to be students of a rabbi. To sit under the teachings of a rabbi in a listening posture meant that one day you too would become a rabbi. And so quietly she had taken her place as a teacher and preacher of the kingdom of God eventually. And, well, yeah, sure, Martha was busy with meal preparations. But her, her plea for Mary's help was about propriety. And Martha basically was saying that Mary really should get back in the kitchen to be where women belong. What the passage is saying here is that no one, not a man or a woman, will be prevented from listening to Jesus, from encountering Jesus. Other passages emphasize that children are welcomed by Jesus, had no status at all, even less than women. Jews and Gentiles alike, slave and free, everyone had access to Jesus regardless of the social norms of the day. Jesus affirmed Mary in her place in a listening posture. Immediately after that account, we have the disciples asking Jesus to teach them how to pray. They'd been hanging out with Jesus for a long time, and yet they ask him how to pray. And Jesus teaches the Lord's Prayer. If you look at it, it's just a, a few verses, very short pericope. And that stands in stark contrast to how others prayed, like the Pharisees and the priests who, whose practice of prayer was very different, and we'll come back to that a little later. The passage in its context tells us many things about how we grow as a follower of the way. It brings us to our first point, which is listening prayer. Listening with a desire to understand another person it's an act of love. It is an act of love. Because listening can be hard work. Hard work. It takes concentration, takes focus. A couple of years ago, I was at Vaughan Community Church in the north part of Toronto, and I was in a prayer meeting where their practice of prayer was a little different than ours. They, they prayed all together and all at the same time, audibly, out loud, simultaneously, and in their own language. It was a beautiful experience with about 200 people all praying at the same time in their own words, in their own language. Only one problem, I couldn't hear or understand what was being prayed. That was okay, because they weren't talking to me anyway, were they? No. Listening to God in prayer is more difficult than speaking to God in prayer. Mary took on a listening posture with Jesus. How often do we do that? The Lord knows I don't do it enough. In a public role of being a worship leader, I'm mindful of those religious types that Jesus talked about in Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 and 6, where we read, And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray... Go into your room, Jesus says, close the door and pray to your Father who's unseen. 
Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. You see, a listening posture before God, free of distractions, done in secret with a motivation of actually connecting with the living God is rare among us who are, well, we're always busy doing something, or at least look like we're doing something. We pull out our phones and, you know, start working on them. Lately, I've been reading a book called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry by John Mark Comer, whose central thesis actually comes from Another author, Dallas Willard, a favorite author of mine, who was once asked uh, by uh, John Mark Comer, what do I need to do to become the me I want to be? And that itself is a rather profound question, isn't it? I mean, <clears throat> what is the me I want to be? What is the metric of success in your life? I mean, on your deathbed, will you be saying, I wish I had spent more time at the office? <laughs> really? Dallas reflected on the question for a few moments and then replied to the question. He said, you must eliminate, you must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. You must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. Now, Martha, she was distracted by preparations and propriety, too busy to pay attention to Jesus. She was worried about appearances, about Mary behaving like a man of all things. And according to Jesus, Mary had chosen what is better. The thing is, type A personalities like myself, like Martha, we're always preoccupied with getting things done, you know, and, and there are always a million and one things to get done. If we're to take this passage seriously, we need to ask ourselves, what are you trying to accomplish? Really, what are you trying to accomplish in your life? Do you, what do, you, do you want to focus more on whom you're becoming as a follower of the way? And if so, you too need to focus on listening prayer, seeking revival, as Psalm 85 says, says, as Megan read for us earlier, let me hear, let me hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people, to his saints. The psalmist expresses a desire to ask the Lord to speak, and it expresses a commitment to hear what he has to say to us, and that's what Mary's Commitment was, as she refused to be consumed by the busyness or the social norms of the day, she took up a listening posture, and most frequently when we pray, our prayers, mine included, are often prayers of petition and intercession, and in my arrogance, I'm prone to advise God on what to do in situations. When we're taking on a listening posture, we seek out that still, small voice that scriptures speak of in 1 Kings 19 and 12 that may open us to new perspectives and new insights and applied wisdom. And really, it's all about nourishing that relationship with the living God. Far be it from me to criticize you in terms of how you pray, but... If your prayer life is all monologue coming from you, instructing God or putting a request before him, you're not doing much listening. Monologue may be better than nothing. I mean, <laughs> I'm just delighted you want to pray at all. But at the risk of upsetting someone today, I wonder if you've ever come across somebody that talks incessantly, you know, besides me from the pulpit, of course, right? But I mean, somebody that, that fills all the space in a conversation, never listening, never providing an opportunity for a, a dialogue. It creates a one-sided relationship. Uh, one person in a prayer meeting prayed, Lord, 
I talk too much. <laughs> so true. So true for so many of us when it comes to prayer. For a robust relationship with God, few words may be better. When Jesus taught his disciples how to pray, notice the Lord's prayer was so brief. Just a few phrases. So carry with you this truth. Carry with you this truth. Prayer is measured by its depth, not by its length. Prayer is measured by its depth, not by its length. A listening posture in order to connect with the living God takes place in prayer, but it takes place in other ways too and brings us to our second point for this morning, which is listening in the word. As I mentioned earlier, as a brand new Christian, I already intuitively knew that I needed to read the Bible in order to connect with with the living God. And over the years, God has given me, I thank God for this, he's given me an appetite, a hunger for his word that's never left me. It's always been there. And there's a difference between reading the Bible and reading the word of God as self-revelation. One author describes some churches as being educated beyond their obedience. Educated beyond their obedience. In other words, some churches, especially some Reformed and Evangelical churches like this one, are so devoted to biblical knowledge that their spiritual lives just haven't caught up to the knowledge that they contain. They may know all about the scriptures, but may not know about its appropriate interpretation and application to their lives, transforming them as it is God's self-revelation. And here, of course, at St. Andrews, we believe that the quality and the significance of people's lives are transformed, absolutely transformed by Jesus Christ. As the Holy Spirit applies his word to our lives, we begin living out its truths as we seek to glorify God. The thing is, having lots of biblical knowledge is not the same as becoming a mature disciple of Jesus. They're different things. Yes, it's important to have biblical knowledge, but maturity in Jesus only takes place as the Bible becomes the living word of God in our lives. As 1 Corinthians 8, verse 1 warns us, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. There was a time in my life, confession's good for the soul, I guess. There was a time in my life when I was really annoying. (laughs) I know, some of you are going to ask, when's that going to stop? Stepped into that one. One time, I had the habit of quoting the Bible in almost any and every situation I found myself in without much of a filter. Now, if you really want to irritate a (laughs) non-Christian, that's a good way to do it. Thing is, I had the biblical knowledge, but I did not have the Christian maturity or love needed to accompany it. Some have described the Bible as a how-to manual from God, how-to manual for Christian living. Oh, but it's so much more than a manual for life as it is God's self-revelation. If you believe Christian sociologists and their studies and their many surveys that uh, they've undertaken, including the uh, Bible Engagement Survey that uh, the Evangelical Fellowship of Canada was involved in, Christians in Canada, oh, uh, sociologists like Sam Reimer at Crandall University have been involved in other studies as well. You see, they've discovered that Christians in Canada are no longer taking the Bible seriously. Daily Bible reading just isn't done very much anymore by Christians, even Reformed evangelical Christians, to our shame. According to the book I referenced earlier, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, 
we become preoccupied. We've become preoccupied with so many other things in life. We've crowded the Bible out of our daily habits. Some Christians even say things like, well, you know, I've read the Bible from cover to cover. I've read it all. As if to say, been there, done that. What's next? Having just a short passage applied deeply to your soul can be far more formative in your life than reading the Bible from cover to cover. Reading the Bible in truly a listening posture, truly devotionally, means we're reading it in such a way as to expect God to reveal new insights to us, even from familiar passages. I don't know how many times I've read the passage before us today, preparing for this today's message. I never considered Mary's listening posture before Jesus as being countercultural. But it's there. Jesus was breaking down barriers for women to be able to gain access to God. Reading scripture in such a way as to listen to what God specifically wants to say to me is a crucial posture to connect with God. Now, none of us are too busy being Martha's. I mean, that excuse of having to prepare this or that, that just doesn't fly. Because you and I, we have the same 1,440 seconds in a day, or minutes in a day, rather. You don't have to wait for your pastor to unpack the truths of the scriptures for you. It's something that you can do for yourself, something you need to do for yourself without somebody spoon-feeding you. Perhaps a great prayer for you would be to pray for a hunger and a thirst in yourself and for God's people so that they would hear his word. And when that hunger and thirst is there for his word, our souls, you see, are, are quenched and satisfied as the Holy Spirit applies his word to our lives. We're enabled to grow as a result. Now, as you can see, I, I love food. Uh, probably a bit too much. But when Jesus re, uh, resisted the temptation of turning stones into bread after fasting for 40 days, Jesus used scripture as a defense, saying, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God in Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. Ask yourself, do you crave the word of God as we crave food? Can you find satisfaction for your soul from what God has spoken? I sincerely pray that I'll never lose that hunger and thirst for his word as it connects me to the living God when I take a listening posture before, and I hope and pray it never goes away. A listening posture in prayer and with God's word is important in connecting with the living God. That brings us to our third point for this morning in connecting, which is spiritual exercises. A couple of weeks ago, one of our scripture readings was from 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 and uh, through to 27. He reads, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it uh, my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Spiritual strict training enables our connectedness to the living God. 
an athlete training for the Olympic does all kinds of things to be at the very top of their game. And Christians, we do the same thing. Now, some of those exercises have gotten a bad rap over the years because they are misunderstood and they're confused with kind of a mechanical formula which basically says if you do these, do these things, you will achieve salvation. That's a works righteousness theology. It's foreign to Reformed theology and tradition. In this tradition, in the Reformed tradition, we celebrate that our salvation is totally and completely dependent upon what God does for us, not the other way around. We celebrate the five solas of the Reformation, that we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, according to the Scriptures alone, to the glory of God alone, not to our glory. Spiritual exercises help us as Christians in connecting to God. And the most Christians, most Christians around the world do a number of these exercises, and, and often we do them without even knowing that they have a long history in the Christian tradition. Those who have journeyed as followers of the way for centuries, long before I was even a twinkle in my father's eye, those spiritual traditions, those exercises were there. Let me give you an example we've already touched on. Why do you think Jesus was fasting in the desert for 40 days? He didn't do it to earn God's approval. He didn't do it to impress God in some way. Similarly, during Lent, we don't fast in order to earn God's approval or to impress others with how spiritual we are. I mentioned earlier that I love food, didn't I? Yeah, maybe a little too much. Hard to believe, but doing without food in my life, doing without food for a while, purposefully, for spiritual exercise, actually feeds my soul like nothing else can. Spiritual fasting combined with solitude and meditation on his word and a listening posture works like a reset button in my soul. My spiritual life, retraining my soul to find satisfaction in God rather than in food or anything else in this world. It helps me to recognize my total and utter dependency upon Jehovah Jireh. God is my provider. Everything that I have, even every breath that I take is a gift from God. That's the kind of spiritual reset, fasting, solitude, listening, prayer, has on my life. Now, when our spiritual lives become a little routine to, or dry or lacking vitality, these various spiritual exercises are great for renewing that connection with God. I've included in the application page that uh, you should have received by email uh, or it's available in hard copy here as well, uh, titles of some books that can help you develop these spiritual exercises in your own specific situation. And it may be different than mine. Take meditation as an example of one such exercise. You might spend hours and hours meditating upon one simple phrase like, be still and know that I am God. That single verse is enough to chew on for a long, long time as the Holy Spirit reminds us of exactly who God is and also who we are as objects of his creation. The intention of these exercises is not to get through them as a sense of accomplishment. You need to find the right exercises to suit your specific situation and station in life. 
an athlete training for a marathon, for example, has a very different training process than an athlete training for a 100-yard dash. Very different. Spiritual exercises are a means to developing connectedness with God, enhancing the quality of our spiritual health, enhancing the quality of our vitality and vibrancy of that relationship. Moving forward, those exercises, these exercises, uh, having a coach alongside you to help you develop a plan to work on a particular area in your spiritual life can be extremely helpful, can be tremendously helpful just in accountability, never mind in whatever strategies you might, might use, whatever exercises you might choose to help get you there. So in conclusion this morning, on Monday this past week, in the Times and Transcript, there was a story about a guy from Moncton by the name of Ryan Sivley, who happened to be in Texas during the uh, cold snap and uh, the snowstorms down there. And he was driving a four-wheel drive pickup truck, which uh, he's very accustomed to doing off-roading with uh, here in New Brunswick. Apparently, he pulled one stuck vehicle out of the ditch after another, rescuing some 500 stuck drivers. Amazing. You see, God loves us so much that he doesn't abandon us when we're stuck spiritually. Some people listening today might feel stuck in their spiritual lives in which their their sense of connectedness to the living God might be remote. He's way out there distant and, you know, that relationship is rather flat and stale. Happens sometimes, the desert of the soul. Folks, you don't need to stay like that. You don't need to stay like that. We're here to help you, to pull you out of that rut. Listening prayer, listening posture of reading the scriptures, spiritual exercises, they can help you to move forward in that relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Becoming a disciple of Jesus, becoming a follower of the way will lead you into that lifelong process of growth. That's rather exciting. God loves you so much. He does not want to leave you in the quagmire of your sin and your alienation, the busyness of your life or the distance that you feel from God due to some cultural norm that exists today. He has sent Jesus for you and he wants to continually connect with you so that so he's provided us with means by which we can become connected to him through his Holy Spirit enabling that connection. Amen.